take you to a city. I was praying and over at the sanctuary, way in the middle of the night, the Lord spoke to me and said, I've heard your prayer from the sanctuary. Then he said, turn to a passage of scripture. I turned to that passage of scripture and he was telling David, I have heard your prayer from the sanctuary. I got back home and Kelly was leaned over the couch crying and squalling and praying and she said, I want you to see what the Lord has showed me. I said, what is this? We had been praying. We'd been there three years. We'd been praying about going to a place with more potential. There was only 2,400 people in the town and 9,000 in the county. And she said, uh -huh. Psalm 104, verses 4 through 7, it says, They wandered in a wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Uh, hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. And they cried to the Lord because of their trouble or by reason of their affliction. And he says, And he delivered them out of their stresses, distresses, and he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. Now, I want you to understand it wasn't as black and white as I just read it to you because I did not leave Claxton for another two years. In the meantime, I shared that with an overseer who told me I've taken things way out of context and whatever, and I almost made the Assembly of God a decent pastor. Are you with me? Say amen. I was raised in the Assembly, and I didn't know where to go. I didn't know where to turn. But I found out that you can turn to God regardless at any time, despite what the circumstances say. Circumstances for me look bleak. Uh, it, it, it seemed like there's no way. But I want to tell you, regardless of your situation and regardless of the evaluation you have right now of your current circumstances, you can believe the promise of God. Doesn't matter what your enemies are saying. Now, why do you need to know that? Because you and I, you, you, I'm not the only one that's had promises. You've had promises. And here's the deal. With your promise and my promise, oftentimes they look absolutely impossible. Matter of fact, they just look laughable sometimes. And we don't understand what's how it's going to happen. But I want you to know that if God says something can happen, what is impossible with man is still possible with God. Let me tell you a quick story of a fellow by the name of Tim. He grew up in a middle class with five brothers and a sister. When he was 11 years old, his father was killed in a car accident. Tim quickly found that the, the, the deck was stacked against him in this life. So he struggled through his young years, through middle and high, he struggled through college, and then as a, an adult, when he could finally have the freedom to take uh, and act on his own, he acted on his fear, he acted on his guilt, and all the other pent-up emotions from the death of his father, leaving too young, and all that has been dealt him that he had to deal with, and, you know, he didn't have the childhood with his dad, uh, his mother's raising all this big family, and all the things he felt cheated, and he was just angry, and he started living in the fast lane. He decided to dabble in drugs, and so he did that, and not long he was selling drugs because he could make more money, and that was his lifestyle. And eventually Tim was arrested, went to trial, and was incarcerated. There in prison, he had one of them prodigal son moments where he just sort of came to himself and realized that this is, this is what's happened to me. It's because of decisions that I have made. It's because of actions that I have taken. And, and he just really began to own it. Even though his dad died young and he was dealt a bad hand, he really began to own the whole thing, and he took full responsibility as he looked in the mirror one day. He began taking some courses, and he began doing some comedy, and he began to organize talent shows in prison, and he really began to rise to the top, and there come a day where he was released from prison, and as he got out of prison, uh, he was noticed by a big company, and this company thought a lot of him and they suggested him to Disney and Disney looked at him and made him a huge offer to be in a program and a book and all of that and um, but he declined that he said no I don't want to go to Disney and then they made him two more offers and he said no but he eventually became Tim Allen that was him and he eventually got his own home improvement show went on to be a number one in that realm and that sitcom stuff and then um, then he went on to write a best-selling book. Now, I don't know how he got the title, but don't stand too close to a naked man. And then, <laughs> makes sense to me. And then, and then he, he went on to play in a classic called The Santa Claus. And so, uh, you, I, I, hey, that's not bad for an ex-con. Are you with me? But when you take responsibility for yourself, you, you know, when you decide that this is me and this is my plight and I'm here, let me tell you this, 
where I'm at today is a result of decisions I made years ago and actions I took years ago. And, and then what I do today, you see, my future will be, and your future will be a reflection of the decisions you make today. So uh, I, just, I just want you to know that you have to take responsibility. And moms, that's you. You just got to take responsibility. You do take responsibility. And, you know, you know, around your house, you're a very responsible person. Anytime things go wrong, I'm responsible, right? <laughs> so, so, so when we understand that God, we can believe the promises of God, and we need to know that because they're sometimes very, very difficult. But here's what you, you got to do. You have to take God at his word. If he made you a promise... You've got to take him at his word. I don't care if it's for a house, for a car, for a closer walk, for a degree, whatever. You've got to take him at his word. Let me take you to the book of 2 Kings. And I just want to read this, and I don't have time to read it all, so I'm going to sort of read and then just uh, commentate along the way. But in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 8, uh, right on down through, I believe, the end of the chapter. We may not get there. But we find one day Elisha went to Shunem. Now, Shunem was a, a road between Samaria and Carmel, and um, there was a school of, of the prophets at Carmel, and he was making his way through Shunem toward Carmel, and he'd done this all the time. And the Bible says, and a well-to-do woman. Now, I, I don't, you put your own definition with that, but a well-to-do woman. I don't know if she just dressed very well, if she kept her hair real nice, if she had on nice perfume. I don't know. But the Bible says a well-to-do woman was there, and she urged him to stay for a meal. And so whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. So in other words, it wasn't just one time he passed through. He was headed toward the school of the prophets a pretty good bit. And this well-to-do woman just, just said, won't you just come on in here and eat? And so one day she said to her husband, now ladies, I want you to understand, you've got some power in your life. You've got some power because most time, whatever you tell your husband, you're eventually going to get it. Now it might take three months or maybe six and sometimes maybe a year. But you're going to get it, so just hang in there. But she said to her husband, I know that this man, and she's a discerning woman, I want you to get this, I know that this man who comes this way often is a holy man of God. She said, so I want us, if you will, verse 10, let us make a small room for him and put it on the roof uh, and put a bed there and a table and a chair and a lamp for him that when he comes here, he can just come and stay with us. And one day Elisha came up, uh, he went to his room, and he lay down there. Now, I want you to see the characteristics of this woman first, and I'll, I'll move quickly. She would not quit until she had a place of refuge for the man of God that was tra traversing back and forth between home and the school of the prophets. And this woman just wouldn't quit, man. She had, obviously, some clout with her husband, and she's, she's a great woman. She had confidence, no doubt. She was a hospitable woman. She didn't mind cooking and feeding. And she was a discerning woman. She says, this is a great man of God. She was a woman of action. She didn't wait even to be asked, may I turn in? He probably wouldn't have asked. But she was a woman of action. She said, this is something that I can do, and this is something that I'm going to do. And then her suggestion, uh, very, very uh, forward suggestion to her husband, let's do this. Let's build on to the house. And so... One day, the man of God, and hey, by the you might do that for one guy, but two. Elisha had a sidekick. The Bible calls him his servant. His name was Gehazi. And where Elisha went, Gehazi went with him. And the Bible says, he said to Gehazi one day in verse number 12, call the Shunammite woman, and she stood before him, and he said, tell her you've gone to all this trouble for us, and uh, now, now what can we do for you? I want to tell you something. When you go to trouble for God, God will go to bat for you. Amen. He said, ask the Shunammite woman. She said, you've gone to all this trouble. You built this room, this chair, this lamp, got a couple beds in here. Every time, I mean, this is like a motel for free, and you cook for us. And what is it that we can do for you? And he said, uh, ask her, can we speak to the commander of the army for her? Could we speak to the king? In other words, Elijah, or excuse me, Elisha had some clout, and he was a very, very known guy. He said, I can talk to the commander of the army if anybody's messing with you. If you need anything done, we, we can take care of some things. we got some connections. And she says, I live among my own people. In other words, I, I've got everything I need. I don't really need anything. I just want to be a blessing. I just want to be a blessing, basically. And, um, you know, I, I have a home among my own people. Uh, well, 
Then in a conversation between Gehazi and Elisha, Elisha, the man of God, says to Gehazi, well, then what in the world can we do for her? So then Gehazi decides to look at her situation. And I want to tell you something, when you begin to do what you need to be doing for God and you have this kind of re, uh, rapport with God that this woman has, God takes notices, uh, notice of you and begins to evaluate things that you ain't even asked about. Gehazi said, well, Elisha, couple thing, uh, one thing I've noticed, really two. He said, first of all, she don't have a son. That was, that was bad in those days. She don't have a son. And number two, her husband's old. Y'all just figure that one out however you want to. But she, she don't have a son, and her husband is old. So Elisha said, call her back. And so she got back to the, the house, and while she was standing in the door, I don't know if she had her hand on her hip like mom sometimes do. What? I don't know. But he said, while she's standing in the door, he says to her, about this time next year, you're going to be standing right there holding a baby. She says, no, 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 my Lord. Please, man of God, don't mislead your servant. Notice how the respect, notice the respect. She, she didn't say, don't lie to me. She said, please just don't mislead me. I, I, don't mislead me. He said, no, no, about this time next year. You can have. And so sure as, the, uh, sure as the sun comes up, uh, she become pregnant. Next year, about the same time, she gave birth just as Elisha had told her. And, and I want you to understand, let me say this about the promise, because I told you we, we can believe the promise of God, and sometimes they're impossible. But uh, our action is to take hold of the promise and hang on to it. I want to tell you something. She hung on to that promise for that year. And after a few months passed by, she got pregnant. All of a sudden, the promise is being realized. She's cooking and realizing, man, I'm getting out there a little bit. I can't stand quite as close to the counter as I used to. Are y'all with me? You can take God at his word. And, and, and then the Bible says, uh, or first let me tell you, Satan will always try to cast doubt on God's promise. He will do anything he can to discourage you, mom, and make you lose hope. So let, let's fast forward a few years. The child has grown. I don't know how old he is, seven, eight years old. I'm not sure, but he's grown up now somewhat. And he's out in the field and he's helping his daddy in the field. And all of a sudden he says, my head, my head, and he just fainted. Well, what does daddy do? He tells the servant, get him to his mama. Because I mean, I mean, daddy don't know what to do. You get him to his mama. So they carried him to his mother, and the boy sat on his mother's lap until noon and then died. Now, again, the devil do everything he can to make you disbelieve. Now, I want you to notice what she did. So she went up. She did, I mean, she didn't even go back out there and tell her husband in the field still doing all that. She didn't, I mean, the boy sat there on her lap. The servant's done gone back in the field, and he sat there with, with his mom, and then he dies. She picks him up and walks up on the loft and lays him on the man of God's bed. Now, I, I, this is Mike. I don't know why she didn't just go in the room next door to the living room and lay him on her own bed. I don't know why she didn't just sort of scooch over and lay his head on the pillow right there on the couch. Something has to be said for your faith when you pick him up and walk up the stairs to the man of God's bed and lay him on it. But he's still dead. And then she called her husband and said, bring me, uh, get me a servant with one of the donkeys. I got to go to the man of God. And, and he still, daddy don't even know what in the world's going on. He said, why are you going today? It ain't Sunday or it ain't the Sabbath. It ain't the new moon. They would always go at those times. And she said, everything's all right. Man, that's some serious faith. She says to her husband, it's all right. Just get me the donkey and get me the guy. Now, don't you understand? She's going to have at least, at least a 17-mile trek on a donkey. She grabbed that servant and she said, don't you slack up not one bit. See, it was common for riders to slow down for the women in those days. She said, don't you slack one bit. You run to the man of God as fast as you can go and I'll be all right. Let me tell you, mama wouldn't quit. Are you hearing me? And so she set out to Mount Carmel to find the man of God. And when she saw, uh, when the man of God saw her in the distance, he said to Gehazi, that looks like the Shunammite in the distance. Run to meet her. Ask her, are you all right? Is your husband all right? And he said, all right. And he got to her and he said, is everything all right? And she said, it is well. It is well. She said, everything's all right. 
Let me tell you, I believe what her faith is saying is this. My son's laying on the man of God's bed. I'm in the man of God's presence. Listen, it ain't the man, but it's the God of the man. And she says, what I'm, uh, what I'm saying is, by faith, everything is going to be all right. But she would not quit. She wouldn't give it. Listen, remember, she's already told her husband everything's all right. When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she lays hold of his feet. She grabs him by his feet. Gehazi came over to push her away because Gehazi was kind of like the armor bearer type of today. In other words, you got so close to the man of God and that was it. There was a certain space you just didn't invade. And Gehazi went over to push her back. And, and, And Elisha said, no, 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 no. He said, leave her alone. She's in the bitterness of her soul and distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me, and he's not told me why. He said, now I want you to notice something. I got you gotta get this. Mom, here's this. Her baby's dead on up up there. And and he says, she she didn't say, you lying scoundrel of a so-called man of God. No, 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 no. She said, did not I ask? Uh, She said, did I ask for a son, my Lord? Didn't I tell you not to raise my hopes? She comes to him with such an awe and such a respect. She don't even hint at the fact that he had lied to her or or anything like that. Notice here, she never says the boy's dead. She don't even say that. She said it's well. Didn't I tell you not to get my hopes up? And then Elisha said to Gehazi's servant, tuck your cloak into your belt. Take my staff and run 17 miles. Run, get to where the boy's at and lay my staff on him. So Gehazi took off, man. I mean, he took off. Some of y'all want to be the man of God's prophet or you want to be the servant of the man of God. And Elisha was saying, you see, I mean, Josh has got a car. I mean, he, he got a nice new truck. Amen. He, anyway, but Elisha said, here's what Elisha said. Don't stop for conversation along the way. If somebody greets you, don't even greet them back because that will ignite conversation. What I would say to Josh is don't even answer your iPhone. Just go. (laughs) But the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. So she said, I ain't leaving you, Elisha. I'm staying right with you, man of God. And so he decides to get up. Gehazi went on. He laid his staff on the boy and nothing happened. The boy has not awakened. Gehazi's done what he was told to do. He comes back. He said, Master, I've done what you told me to do, and it didn't work. The boy's still dead. Are you with me? Understand something. Thank God the prophet wasn't finished. Amen. Mama wasn't going to give up with that answer. The prophet wasn't going to give up with that answer. And God wasn't going to give up with that answer. So Elisha got to the house. There's the boy laying dead on the, uh, dead on the bed, if you will. So he goes in, shuts the door on the two of them, and begins to pray to the Lord. Now, this is a little unorthodox. Some of you first-timers, you're going to freak right here. So I want you to just sort of get close to somebody. Hold on to them. The man of God goes upstairs. Here's the boy laying on the bed. He's been dead. Now he's probably, you know, getting cold by the time they done ran 30 miles, you know. So the Bible said Elisha went in, shut the door, and he got on the bed, and he lay on the boy. This is getting a little freaky. I mean, he could have just prayed for him. and could like Jesus just had come forward, but he laid down on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, and hands to hand, and he stretched himself out on the boy, and the boy's body began to grow warm. Uh, and Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room. And then he, I mean, he's, I don't know what he's doing. Maybe he's praying. Lord, I don't know why, but I, I promised this woman, and, and she's had this boy, and I've laid down on him. He doesn't have the Bible said he got back up on him again. Hand to hand, mouth to mouth. I mean, just, he laid on him, and he began to warm. Huh? And, and he stretched himself out once more, and the boy sneezed seven times, and he opened his eyes. And Elisha summoned Gehazi. He called Gehazi. He didn't call him. He said, Gehazi, come here. When she come in, he said, uh, he said, call the Shunammite and tell her to come get her boy. And she fell at his feet and bowed to the ground, and she took her son and went out. Let me say something to you. When God makes a promise to you, it might look impossible, but you hold on to the promise till God shows up. The devil will try everything in hell to make you doubt. Keep on holding on to God. I want to close with this illustration. I've got a picture of one of our young grads. There he is. That's Alan Wright. I remember when his mother stopped by the old parsonage in the old church. 
I guess about 18, 19 years ago now, had had a miscarriage prior to Alan, had gone to the doctor, and I believe they had to do the DNC and all the things they do. I remember her walking in the living room. We, Kelly and I lived in the old parsonage, and I remember she cried and asked us, would you pray for me? We laid hands on her, and we just began to pray for her and ask God to do a miracle. He'll graduate in just a few days. Are y'all with me? Say amen. Why? Because God made a promise, and God keeps his promises. Hey, you better stand with me. Amen. Let me say this. That was a mama that wouldn't quit. This one didn't work out. That didn't work out. But hey, I'll tell you something. Not only is it about mama, it's about a God that says, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you, but I'll go with you even unto the end of this world. God. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you're here today and you need a touch from the Lord, maybe you're here today and maybe you're a mom and you're just stretched out so thin and you don't feel like there's no way. Maybe you're still, you're in between this miracle happening. God made you a promise and you're trying to hold on and trying to believe. While our heads are bowed and eyes closed, you, if that's you, would you just lift your hand up? All across the room, I mean, there is a number of you. I'm trying to believe right now in the midst of all this. I mean, because in this, in this story, there was some time that passed. I want to tell you, just like Kelly and I, it was two years before it ever even come to pass. And then we got here, and, I, 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 and let me say this, the, the process looked bleak because even when I got the opportunity to go to the city, it was in the August of 1995, I had already told the overseer no about coming down here. I had come and I had looked at the property and I looked at the place and I was unimpressed to be honest with you. I was doing better where I was at. And I heard a radio announcer say on national news, he said Camden County, Georgia is the fastest growing county in the United States of America in August of 1995 and it blew my mind. The Lord spoke to me very clearly and said, you've told the overseer no that you would not go because you don't like the way the property looked. You don't like the way the carpet looked. You don't like the rundown condition. You don't like the fact that there's only 15 people left. You don't like all of that. And I've tried to take you to the fastest growing city in, or, or fastest growing county in this country as I promised you two years ago. I swallowed my pride and said, Lord, I'll go. Lord, I'll go. And now look at God. Look at God. 21 years later, look at God. Amen. A lot of water under the bridge. A lot of hardship. A lot of struggles. But let me say this. A lot of victories. If you raise your hand, let me pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, there's a mom right now that's struggling today. I lift her up in the name of Jesus. Lord, if there's someone that heard this message and they know that they needed to hear, I, can, I need to hold on to the promise of God because he never will let go. There's somebody here struggling with that right now. God, wrap your arms around them and reassure them that they're going to make it, that you're going to see them through. And even when it looks bleak, this mother goes to the man of God and her son's dead on the bed. And she said, it's all right. I've got confidence. Lord, transfer that kind of confidence. Give that kind of confidence to your people today. In Jesus' name. Welcome our host if you